Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome to part two in our serial killer series all about the angel of death, Kristen Gilbert. If you have not seen part one, make sure you check out that video. In part one, we discussed Kristen's upbringing, her timeline of starting nursing school, marrying her husband, starting her nursing career, to when she started an affair with James Peralt, and then all of a sudden, her patients started dying on her watch. We also discussed in depth the first three patients who died under mysterious circumstances. In this video, we will be discussing the remainder of the patients who were victimized by Kristen Gilbert, the nurses who started putting the pieces together, how she was caught, how the investigation into these deaths went, and the trial that occurred as a result. We still have a lot to talk about, so let's just get right into it. By early to mid-February, there were three nurses in Ward C who are starting to become very concerned at the sheer amount of patients who were dying from heart conditions under Kristen's watch. Many of those patients had never exhibited heart issues before, so for them to all of a sudden die of heart failure is just bizarre. These nurses had actually been concerned for a few months before February, but by that time, they were really starting to try to look for evidence that they could bring to their higher-ups to prove that Kristen was up to something, rather than just coming to them with speculation and rumor. They didn't just want to come at Kristen with baseless accusations, since that could actually hurt her career, and if she hadn't done anything wrong, they didn't want to be responsible for starting some nasty rumors. Again, she was well-liked by everybody, and even though to us it seems very obvious what's going on, people that were close to the situation didn't exactly know how to go about it, how to investigate it, and how to bring it to their managers and the people that were their bosses. So, to kind of explain how these nurses came together, I first want to note that there were three nurses who each separately noted concerns. John Wall, Renee Walsh, and Kathy Ricks each had their concerns about Kristen, but they never really knew if they were valid. They saw these deaths happening, but if they were just truly awful coincidences, then they didn't want to accuse Kristen of something so serious. But each of these nurses had their own personal experience with Kristen and how she took care of mutual patients of theirs that just did not sit right with them. John Walsh and another nurse, Frank Betrand, had been seeing a COPD patient named Angelo Vela for a while. This patient never had any serious issues, just coming to the hospital, I believe, every month for ongoing IV treatments. But on February 4th, 1996, Kristen was sent into that patient's room to administer medication. But as soon as she stuck him with the needle, he screamed out in pain and his heart rate jumped to almost 300 beats per minute. He went into cardiac arrest, coded, and thankfully was resuscitated. But as soon as he woke up, he screamed that as soon as Kristen injected him with something, that is when his chest started burning. So obviously, this was very, very concerning to his main nurses who knew that he didn't have like any serious heart conditions. Obviously, COPD can lead to heart conditions, but at that time, there was no reason that he should have just gone into sudden cardiac arrest. And this patient literally said like, this happened when she injected me with something. So obviously, that was very concerning. Then there was one day where Renee Walsh had spent the entire day caring for a sick patient who was ill, but she was recovering and was expected to survive. This was a patient that she had been with for a while and Renee grew very close with her. But one evening, Kristen was relieving Renee of her duty and was now caring for this patient for the night shift. Literally within minutes of Renee returning home, Kristen called her to tell her that her patient had just died. It was unbelievable to her, and the way that Kristen told Renee about her patient dying just seemed very heartless to her. There was no emotion in Kristen's voice, she was just flat. And for Renee, that was the very last straw. Then, Kathy Ricks was the one who noticed something off about the medicine carts. They got monthly shipments of epinephrine to the hospital. They didn't really keep records of when the medications were used or how many they had in stock, only noticing when they were low and restocking accordingly. However, Kathy started to notice that they would run out of epinephrine almost every single month, which was very unusual for Ward C. Epinephrine is sometimes used to restart someone's heart after they have experienced a heart attack, 
but this was not something that was commonly used in Ward C. Again, this was a chronic unit for patients who were recovering, not patients with dire urgent concerns. So the fact that they were running out so often really concerned Kathy. That and given the fact that Kathy definitely recognized the strange pattern of Kristen always being the nurse taking care of a patient who suddenly died from heart conditions. Again, even when they didn't come in with any heart conditions. So there was one day when Kathy sat next to Renee at lunch. So again, Kathy and Renee are two of the nurses that were noticing things about Kristen. Renee had sort of noticed something off about Kathy and wondered if she was thinking the same thing about Kristen as her. So she brought it up as casually as she could and that is when the two women started sharing stories back and forth about the things that they noticed. Then John Wall walked in for lunch as well. They also cautiously clued him in on what they were talking about and he confirmed that he had his suspicions too. And with all of the stories that each nurse had to tell, they felt that there was way too much to ignore. By that point, they started to plan what they were going to do. Now, I will get more into this later, but they were kind of afraid to go to their nurse manager. They felt that there was no way that the manager wasn't seeing these deaths and wasn't seeing the pattern and wondered how she could just be ignoring it. Either she was ignoring those deaths or she wasn't catching on to the very obvious spikes in death that were occurring when only Kristen was at the hospital. So, they were scared that if they brought their concerns to their manager, that she would somehow want to cover it up to avoid making the hospital look bad. They didn't know how high up the incompetence went, so they spent the next week trying to figure out what to do. In the meantime, however, the deaths did not stop. Edward Scuria joined the U.S. Army when he was only 18 years old, serving for, I believe, two years before he was discharged. After being discharged, he got married and had three kids. For the decades that followed, he worked as a truck driver. However, Ed eventually developed issues with alcohol. By February of 1996, he was admitted to Adcare Hospital in Worcester, Massachusetts for alcohol abuse. Other than developing diabetes, a few heart problems like hypertension and coronary artery disease, he was in pretty good health for someone who had been drinking liquor pretty much every day for 50 years. So, the hospital believed that if they could get Ed to stop drinking altogether, that his health would drastically improve. So, they decided to hold him in the hospital to detox him. They knew that this would be a very long, grueling process that would take over a week. So, because of the long-term nature of his care, he was transferred to the Leeds VAMC for continued care. He arrived by February 15th, 1996. That day, he wasn't feeling too well, reporting that he was experiencing angina, which is a chest pain related to altered cardiac output, but this was something that he dealt with for quite some time, and he was taking nitroglycerin to help with it. But to make sure that Ed was being taken care of and he wasn't experiencing too much anxiety or pain from the detox, they gave him medication and sedated him before setting him up in the ICU room. They weren't sure if he was having really bad anxiety about detoxing, since that was very common when addicts are having withdrawals from their substance of choice, or it could be something actually heart-related. They performed multiple additional tests, which at first diagnosed him with no heart problems, just basically saying that he was having panic attacks and having a lot of anxiety because of this withdrawal and detox situation. But after doing multiple more tests, he actually ended up being diagnosed with a dissecting thoracic aortic aneurysm, which is a medical emergency and required immediate care. However, the Leeds VAMC was not equipped to handle the type of surgery that he needed, so arrangements were quickly started to get Ed transferred. This was at just before 5 p.m. that same day. I do want to note, though, that it was actually later discovered that Ed did not actually have a thoracic aortic aneurysm. That was a false diagnosis. But at the time, that is what they believed was happening, and that is a very, very serious medical emergency. So in the meantime, Kristen would stay with Ed to monitor his vitals while the transfer was being set up. However, after literally five minutes of being alone with Kristen, she called a code on Edward. 
As the emergency response team all rushed to his room, Kathy noticed that yet another patient of Kristen's had coded. About an hour beforehand, Kathy had actually checked the medicine cart and she saw that there were three bottles of epinephrine in there. So, just going with her gut, Kathy checked the med cart again to see if something was off after the code was called. And it turned out that all of the bottles of epinephrine were gone. In that moment, Kathy knew that Kristen was taking those vials of epinephrine and was administering them to patients for the purpose of causing their cardiac episodes. So for Edward, the rescue team was able to stabilize him and get him intubated, but his condition kept worsening, but he was alive. So they sped up the transfer to the next hospital and off he went. But because he was still alive and was in critical condition, of course, Kristen went into the ambulance with him to oversee the transfer. Once he got to the hospital, the doctors determined that his condition was, again, likely the result of a dissecting aortic aneurysm, and they felt that the issue was so bad that there wasn't anything that they could do to help him. So, they actually ended up giving him morphine to make him more comfortable and transferred him back to the VAMC because they basically said that he was just going to die, that there was nothing that they could do for his dissecting aortic aneurysm, Two days later, by February 18th, 1996, Edward died from his heart attack. Now, at the time, I want to note that before Edward's death, family members reported that he started hallucinating and having delusions. This can be something that happens when someone is dying or even from morphine, but after his death, the toxicology report came back and showed that Edward had ketamine in his system. Ketamine is a drug that can be used for therapeutic purposes in very small doses, but if it is abused, it can cause hallucinations. But every staff member at the hospital denied giving him ketamine. So that means that somebody gave it to him secretly and didn't want the hospital to know. In the meantime, after Kristen and Edward left the hospital to get that initial transfer, Kathy went into the room behind them. She started looking in the bucket where the nurses discarded their empty needles. Now, there were different dosages of epinephrine that the doctors would use to resuscitate a patient in dire emergencies. That dose was a 1 to 10,000 ratio. The needle containing that dose was found in the bin, but Kathy also noticed an additional three needles which contained a 1 to 1,000 ratio, which was not normal. This was the same medication that was found to be missing from the med cart. So at that point, Kathy was confident that Kristen was using this higher ratio of epinephrine to cause these heart problems. So, by that point, Kathy, Renee, and John could not ignore what they were seeing any longer. They set up a meeting with their manager, Melody Turner, who set up a meeting with her boss, Priscilla McDonald. They told her all of the stories that they had previously discussed, all of the patients who had died under Kristen's watch, how many patients never had any heart issues until Kristen took over. A bunch of these patients were perfectly fine, free of any serious heart conditions, until Kristen stuck them with something. They had the patients that had died, but they also had the patients who lived to tell their story. That one patient who literally told the hospital staff that his chest got all hot and burning after Kristen injected him. They pointed out how the sheer number of codes under Kristen's watch was just absurd. So the hospital staff agreed to take a look into the accusations, and in the meantime, they were told to keep a very close eye on Kristen and make sure that nobody else would be hurt. After this meeting, rumors started to fly around the hospital, and soon everyone was aware that Kristen was being looked into. Just a few days after this meeting, special agents from the Washington and Boston's VA Inspectors General's office entered the hospital to start their investigation. As soon as they arrived, people found out that Kristen was being investigated. As that was happening, Kristen started to tell James to keep an eye and ear out for any information that he learned and to report back to her as soon as he heard anything. At first, when these investigations were starting, Kristen continued her job, but a few weeks after that, she did end up quitting. Upon later review, the statistics of deaths and codes that happened during Kristen's shifts were insane, and it started pretty much right when she started nursing. It turned out that between 1990 and 1991, there had been 31 deaths that all happened under Kristen's watch. 
Kristen was named as the person who found 22 of the patients, with other nurses only finding five of them. This death number was triple the amount of any other nurse. Then it also turned out that on Wordsy, there had been 40 codes called between 1990 and 1991, with Kristen calling 20 of them and the eight other nurses calling five of them, not each combined. So that means that on average, there were probably about five nurses who each called one code, while three of them had never called any codes within that one year span. Yet Kristen, she called 20 of them herself. The only other nurse who was even close to calling as many codes as Kristen had only called five codes within two years. And I believe that nurse was working on a completely different ward. Because again, ward C was the ward where longer term patients with more chronic conditions would go. And when I say chronic, I mean things like maybe cancer or again, like diabetes treatments or recovering from an amputation, things that would take a couple of weeks but were not dire emergencies. So the fact that all of these codes were being called in her words specifically was very, very concerning. Then, as we know, by 1993, Kristen started a relationship with James Peralt, which continued until 1996. Investigation found that from October of 1995 to February 17, 1996, so within about four months, there were 23 deaths and almost 30 medical emergencies in Ward C. However, between February 17th of 1996 and July of 1996, also about four months, but the same time that Kristen went out on maternity leave, there had only been four deaths and two medical emergencies on Ward C. Looking at the data from 1990 until 1996, they found that the death numbers for the days that Kristen worked was, on average, double that of the shifts that she did not work. Statistically, according to Dr. Gelbach of the University of Massachusetts School of Public Health, the likelihood of Kristen just happening to work when these death rates were doubled was 1 in 100 million. In total, it is believed that Kristen may have killed over 350 patients and took part in making another 300 severely ill. 75% of all emergency codes requiring intervention during her time working at the VAMC had her name on them. They found that many of the medical records that Kristen kept from the patients who died did not match what other nurses were saying in their documentation. They found a lot of key information missing from Kristen's documentation as well. For example, with Kenny Cutting, she wrote down that his heart rate went from being in the 100s to lowering to the 50s and 60s and then jumping to the 140s. But the telemetry showed that it was steady within the 100s before it shot up to 120 to 130. And in pretty much all of these patients, she failed to include the telemetry strip in the note, which was common practice among patients who had heart problems. So investigators felt that even if this wasn't a smoking gun, it was astronomically more likely that she had something to do with these deaths than her just being a very, very, very unlucky nurse. So in the months that followed, agents started questioning those closest to Kristen, including Glenn and James. At first, neither man could wrap his head around the allegations. Glenn was asked if anything weird ever happened to him, and he did recall that one time that he had a bad reaction to Kristen flushing his arm, but he didn't think that could have been on purpose. Then James, he just could not believe what he was hearing. He was sure that there was no way that Kristen could purposely be hurting her beloved patients. But then, both James and Glenn were confronted with the evidence. The fact that patients were twice as likely to die on her shift than on anybody else's shift at the hospital. That did make both Glenn and James think twice, but it didn't totally convince them. Now, after months of hearing the rumors and having Kristen acting very suspiciously and now hearing the actual evidence that Kristen had to be involved in these deaths, James did decide that he needed to break it off with Kristen. So by July 8th, 1996, James got dinner with Kristen when he told her that things were not going well and that they needed to break up. Of course, Kristen didn't take this well, as James expected. Kristen got up from dinner, ran upstairs into the bathroom, and locked the door. After listening to her sob hysterically on the other side of the door, James sat on her bed trying to figure out how to go about this. 
Then all of a sudden, Kristen burst out of the bathroom holding an empty bottle of her migraine medication and threw it on the bed, yelling, look what you made me do. Basically saying that James caused her to take all these pills and kill herself. She then ran out of the apartment and down the hall. James decided not to chase after her, instead calling 911 to report what happened. Kristen then came back to the apartment, probably stunned that James didn't chase after her, and realized that James had just called the authorities. So, she started scratching him and yelling at him. At that point, authorities arrived and Kristen accused James of hitting her. The police separated them, and after talking to both of them, they did determine that Kristen was the aggressor. They separated the two, and police went on their way. The following day, Kristen was back over at James's place, banging on the door, acting absolutely out of control. So, James decided to actually call Glenn over. Glenn, being the caring, gentle guy that he was, he came over to help, even though he didn't want to. Him and James had never spoken a word to one another at that point, and I'm sure Glenn was not too fond of James, but he decided to help anyways. At that point, James let Kristen in, and by the time Glenn got there, she was balled up in the fetal position on the floor and crying in James's apartment. So, James and Glenn then also decided to get the police involved, who told Kristen that she could either go to a mental hospital or she could go to jail she opted for the mental hospital. While there, James visited her to check in on her. That entire time, Kristen kept telling him that the things that she was being accused of just were not true. She also started to act out, even telling James that she was pregnant. He said that he knew she couldn't be pregnant because they hadn't had sex in months, so Kristen admitted that she just said that to make him upset. James realized that Kristen was just doing and saying whatever she could to get his attention. By July 17th, investigators believed that they had enough to charge Kristen with these murders, and they were able to present their case in front of a grand jury. Obviously, prosecutors explained the statistics that were previously discussed, as well as the missing epinephrine that the other nurses noticed, and the patient testimonies from patients who survived Kristen attempts at their lives. But the most startling testimony came from James Peralt. He testified that while the investigation was going on and the walls were starting to close in on Kristen, she called James and admitted to what she did. She told him that she injected those men with a certain drug. Not only that, but she straight out said that she killed them. But when he was testifying, he sort of made it seem like Kristen was just really stressed when she said all this and may not have meant what she was saying. He, for some reason, was still not 100% convinced that she could have done this. So, at the end of the grand jury, they actually found that there was not enough to actually arrest her at that time. Police needed to keep investigating. After this testimony in the month that followed, Kristen would be hospitalized for mental health treatment three additional times. During those times, she continuously made things up to get the attention of James, and every time, he would show up. She would go to the hospital saying that she tried to kill herself again, but there was one time when she was hospitalized and James showed up and she lashed out and tried attacking him. After multiple visits with psychiatrists during her stays, it was found that she never really had any intention of taking her own life. She was far too narcissistic for that. Instead, everything she did was for attention. They found that she most likely has traits of borderline and narcissistic personalities. At the same time, although James was getting more and more convinced of Kristen's involvement in these deaths, he still had mixed feelings about Kristen and he still wanted to help her. Meanwhile, Glenn, he was in complete denial for a while until August 15th of that year. On that day, he found something out that did not sit right with him. That previous week, Kristen had been bugging him, asking him over and over and over again to come to his place. After telling her no multiple times, Glenn figured that she would probably try to break in, so he sent his stepdad over to his place to watch the house while he was at work, and lo and behold, while he was at work, Kristen arrived. She asked Glenn's stepdad if she could go inside, asking repeatedly to just be allowed to go into the pantry and she would be on her way. But 
he said no. After that, she did try to break in again multiple times, according to neighbors, but she was never able to gain access. So, of course, Glenn was concerned. He didn't know what Kristen wanted to get in that pantry so bad that she went over there and even tried to break in. So, he called the police over to see if they could look inside for him because, again, who knows what could have been in that pantry that she wanted to get her hands on so bad. He didn't know where to look. He didn't know what to look for. So, he asked the police to look. And when police looked, they found a satchel sitting on one of the shelves. And within that satchel, there was a book called the Handbook of Poisoning. It was a 500-page textbook dealing with the different poisoning properties of several types of medications, including epinephrine. It outlined each medication, the dosage necessary for it to be lethal, the symptoms of lethal dosages, and the treatment if someone is subjected to that poison. One of the pages was dog-eared to a page that discussed ketamine and cyanide. And at that point, police started to realize that maybe they should start exhuming the bodies from patients that had died under Kristen's watch. Remember, Ed Swierka died and it was later found out that he did have ketamine in his system. By September of that same year, after everything that he had been through with Kristen and her using and abusing him while she was at the hospital, James decided to end things with Kristen once and for all. He informed her that he was helping with the investigation against her, and with everything going on, he simply could not be with her anymore. So, by September 9th, James agreed to meet up with investigators again to assist them with the investigation. Basically, I think this was sort of a follow-up after his grand jury testimony. But as he was leaving, Kristen pulled up in her car and blocked him from leaving his apartment. At that point, she started yelling at him not to go to the meeting. She begged and pleaded with him, saying that he was going to ruin her life. But he just laid on the horn, saying that he was going to keep beeping and honking and causing a disruption until a neighbor called the police. And if she continued, she could be arrested for obstruction of justice. So finally, she left and he went on his way to the meeting with the officer. After the meeting was finished, James came out to find that the front tire of his car had been slashed and his car had been vandalized and it was obvious that Kristen was the one responsible. By September 26th, 1996, James was working his normal shift at the Leeds VAMC when by 5.22 p.m., he got a call from a voice that was clearly being electronically altered to disguise it. This caller warned James that there were explosives in the building. So, he immediately notified the hospital of the threat and they went into crisis mode. For the following hour, the hospital continued to get calls from that same caller. They gave multiple other threats and warned them that there were bombs in the hospital, but all of them were taunts. The caller called the hospital staff stupid, saying things like, you just want all of the patients to die, don't you? But after moving the most medically stable patients out of the hospital and doing a thorough sweep, they found that the threat was not credible. After that, police had set out to find who was responsible for the bomb threat. Police already had their suspicions on Kristen, but they weren't able to trace the call back to her. So they went and tried to look at various stores to see if they could find what sort of device was used to alter the voice and asked the stores if someone matching Kristen's description matched the sale. After visiting numerous electronic stores with no luck, they started to go to toy stores where they did find a few toys that can be used to alter someone's voice. So after searching numerous stores, they finally landed at a Toys R Us store where they were able to find a receipt for a voice-altering toy. On the morning of September 26, the same day as the bomb threat, Kristen used her own credit card at that Toys R Us to buy a toy that alters your voice. Upon looking at how exactly this toy altered your voice, the sound matched the caller that had called in the bomb threats on September 26th, so that was enough for police to indict Kristen on charges relating to the bomb threat. So, she was arrested and first sent to another mental health hospital for assessment and treatment. After that, she was released on bail, but was ordered to live with her parents in Long Island, New York. By January 1st, 1998, Kristen went on trial for the charges of making a false bomb threat, 
and after 20 days of trial, she was found guilty. It was thought by the jury that she used this bomb threat as a way to try and divert attention away from her and away from the murder investigation. For the bomb threat, she was sentenced to 15 months in prison. While there, she was also treated for her psychiatric problems. While serving her sentence in prison for the bomb threat, by November 24th, 1998, she was finally indicted on murder charges. For the two years that followed, police continued their investigation into the murders, which I will discuss more as we talk more about the trial, but by November 10th, 2000, Kristen's trial for murder finally started. She was facing three counts of first-degree premeditated murder, one count of second-degree murder, and two counts of attempted murder. The prosecution argued that while employed at the VAMC, other staff members started to notice a concerning spike in the deaths during Kristen's shifts. At first, an internal investigation found that there wasn't enough information to say that Kristen was actually responsible, given that the death rates were similar to other hospitals. But that was when she first started working there. As time progressed, and especially during Kristen and James's relationship, the death toll grew higher and higher and higher. The prosecution argued that in the six months after she started to date James, Kristen killed four patients in Ward C and attempted to kill three others by intravenously poisoning them with epinephrine in most cases. In one case, it was argued that she injected a high amount of insulin in one diabetic patient. As we discussed, epinephrine is a colorless, odorless medication that can be used for resuscitating patients in a state of cardiac arrest or anaphylactic shock. So, an EpiPen that is just filled with epinephrine. But when it's used improperly, it can cause fatal, rapid, or irregular heart rate. The four deaths in question were all cardiac-related events. They argued that Kristen had full access to the med cart, which is where she obtained the epinephrine. Once all other medical personnel had left the room, she would inject these patients with the epinephrine under the false pretext that she was flushing their IVs. They said that when doing so, she created these cardiac emergencies, which were able to generate codes where other emergency personnel would respond. One of those personnel was James Peralt. The prosecution argued that she orchestrated these codes in order to get the excitement and attention that she so desperately craved from James. Then, with one of the codes, specifically Kenny Cutting, she called one of the codes and made him die so that she could leave work early and spend more time with James. Then, as we discussed earlier, the amount of codes that were happening while Kristen was working was triple that of any other nurse. Then, it also turned out that between October 1st, 1996 and February 17th, 1996, there was not a single code called on Ward C on a night that James was not working. So, even if Kristen was working a night, if James wasn't working, there were no codes called. So, there is some sort of correlation here. Now, there were a total of 70 witnesses and 200 pieces of evidence presented at trial. I will try my best to condense this all down to not overwhelm you and to avoid being too repetitive. One person who testified was a university professor who we discussed earlier, who said that the statistical likelihood of Kristen being around for that many codes at the hospital was 1 in 100 million. He ran an entire statistical report, which includes all of the research jargon that I learned about in my critical inquiry classes in grad school, Research is not my thing, and I do not want to take the time to discuss all of the variables and p-values and what kind of statistical tests were done, because I don't think you would find it interesting anyways. Some of you might, but I personally don't. I think it's kind of boring. But what I will say is that they did do an entire analysis of these cases and pointed out the limitations of their studies, so it seemed like a very legit study in my opinion. I did read it, and I did think that it seemed like a pretty good study. Using that, a lot of what the prosecution discussed was based on those statistical findings, which was significant because they didn't know every single patient that she could have had involvement with or exactly how. But they did see the correlations that were happening while Kristen was working that 
all of these patients were dying while she was working and that these patients were not dying while she was not working. Many of the nurses who took care of the patients that died, such as Stanley Jagodowski's, said that they were not scheduled to receive medications on the days or times that they saw Kristen entering their rooms. Other hospitals who worked at the VAMC who reviewed the medical charts from the patients in question, they agreed that their deaths are consistent with epinephrine poisoning. While some of those patients had suffered from heart conditions, none of them showed signs of fatal heart failure or anything of the sorts in the moments before they coded. It always seemed to jump so suddenly from very normal to sudden cardiac arrest. Many, many of these patients were in fact recovering. They were getting better when they suddenly suffered from a heart attack. The medical examiner who exhumed the bodies said that there were unusually high levels of epinephrine in all of their systems. Then, in the case of Ed Swirka, like I said earlier, he coded multiple times until he was transferred to another hospital with Kristen riding alongside him in the ambulance. The medical examiner testified that even though he drank chronically, that is not what caused his death. He surprisingly had a healthy liver and an otherwise healthy heart there were absolutely no signs of a thoracic aortic aneurysm like the hospital originally thought. It was a sudden cardiac event with no clear cause. Then, after suffering this event and being transferred, once he got to the hospital, he started to hallucinate. Like I mentioned earlier, after completing his autopsy, it came back positive for ketamine. The prosecution argued that Kristen attempted to kill Ed multiple times with epinephrine, but when he kept surviving, she went with ketamine instead. Back in 1996, ketamine was not as controlled of a substance, so it was relatively easy to get your hands on it. Kristen's pet's veterinarian testified at the trial that there were multiple instances in which Kristen called the vet office and requested ketamine for her sick pets multiple times. So, it is known that she did have her hands on ketamine at some point. Then, as we know, Henry Huden was another patient who died very unexpectedly. He did have a long list of medical problems, but heart issues were not one of them. Even when Henry thought he might have had heart issues, it turned out to be caused by anxiety attacks. So, there was absolutely no reason why Henry should have gone into sudden cardiac arrest. Then, as we discussed earlier, Henry's codes almost perfectly coincided with Kristen emailing back and forth with James. When too much time would pass between James responding to an email, suddenly, Henry would code and Kristen got to see James. The other patient who Kristen tried to kill was Angelo Vela, who I mentioned earlier. He was being cared for by another nurse named Frank Betrand. He was the patient who had COPD with no other serious heart issues and was definitely not a patient that the staff was worried about coding. He literally went into the hospital on a regular basis to get his treatment, but otherwise, he was out living his life as normal. But then, on that fateful day in February of 1996, when Kristen took over care momentarily, just minutes after she came at him with that needle, he screamed out in pain. Then he had cardiac arrhythmias and tachycardia, which he thankfully survived. But the only person who could have been responsible was Kristen. Because again, Angelo pointed at Kristen and said, this nurse stuck me with something and then suddenly my chest got really hot and I had heart palpitations. So Kristen could have been the only one responsible for attempting to kill him. At the trial, we heard from John Wall, Renee Walsh, and Kathy Ricks, who I mentioned earlier. They were the three nurses who jump-started the investigation into Kristen to begin with. Of course, the defense tried to poke holes in their stories, saying that this was all speculation. They had no concrete evidence against Kristen, but it was pretty damning to hear about how Renee happened to notice that the epinephrine was missing right after these medical events would happen, and then how right when these nurses would hand their patients over to Kristen, that is when they got significantly worse. Kathy Ricks talked about her experience with seeing those missing epinephrine tubes and then finding them broken in the room that Kristen and her patient had just left after he had a medical emergency. And that is the moment that just confirmed to Kathy that Kristen was a monster. Now, the one person that I have yet to mention when it comes to the trial and evidence is Glenn Gilbert. Glenn Gilbert. 
Glenn, again, was in denial for quite some time. Throughout the investigation, it did seem like he withheld certain information from the police that he knew would be very damning to Kristen. I honestly just feel like he was not accepting what Kristen could have done to him and many, many other patients, but in the end, he did testify. Now, Kristen wasn't being charged with anything in relation to Glenn's alleged attempted murder, but his testimony did shed some light on the lengths that Kristen was willing to go to for her relationship with James. He basically talked about how Kristen injected him with a clear liquid under the pretext that he was flushing his veins before drawing blood from his arm. That was after he had fallen sick multiple times, ending up in the hospital with dangerously low potassium levels. Of course, it was thought that Kristen was poisoning Glenn's food for quite some time, most likely with some sort of diuretic to dehydrate him. Again, as we heard earlier, she suddenly started cooking for Glenn as their relationship was going to the tanks, and he felt that it tasted pretty chalky. But again, at the time, he didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to hurt her feelings. Once the long-term poisoning didn't work, she went for other heart medications like nifedipine and captopril, most likely. Remember, these were the medications that another nurse saw in her jacket pocket one day a long time ago, around the same time that she was telling the other nurses about Glenn's health problems. But even after she allegedly injected him with that as well, he survived that too. So, she was forced to put on her big girl pants and just break up with him, which seemed to go very simple and smoothly, so there was no reason for all of this at all. She didn't care about the kids, she didn't fight for custody for them or anything, so there was really no reason for her to go to those lengths when Glenn was just pretty accepting of their divorce. Obviously, he wanted to work on things, but it's not like he was obsessive or following her or making her life as hard as possible after she broke up with him. They kind of just went about their lives separately. But during the trial, Glenn also testified that during one of Kristen's hospitalizations, Kristen called him and was hysterical. He said that at that time, Kristen told Glenn that she wanted to save the taxpayer's money by not going to trial because she did it she was guilty. That is what she apparently told Glenn. Now, on the other hand, the defense claimed that the government was on a witch hunt to blame Kristen for her bad luck. They said that Kristen was a good mother, a good nurse, and that she loved her husband until things just simply did not work out. Having two kids and working separate schedules, that puts a lot of strain on a marriage. They said that rumors started to fly around the hospital, mostly started by the three nurses that I mentioned earlier. The defense argued that the missing epinephrine doesn't necessarily mean that Kristen was the one who took it. Epinephrine can be used and abused just like any other drug. So, who is to say that another nurse, such as John Wall, wasn't taking the drug and using it. Then, when these drug addict nurses noticed that the missing epinephrine was being noticed, they blamed Kristen to cover up that John was the one actually taking it. The defense really tried to go hard into the personal lives of John Wall and the other nurses who they accused of taking the epinephrine. Obviously, I'm not going to go too deep into that because although it was part of the trial, it's really not true. It's not really backed up by anything. It was stated that the amount of smear that they tried to paint on these nurses was just completely out of hand, so I'm not going to repeat everything they said. So, I'm just going to sort of summarize what they said. They pointed to other addictions that John Wall had with other drugs and alcohol, and they said that these medications were open to anybody in the hospital, not just the med cart nurse so anybody could have been taking them. Then, to add to that, they didn't keep any record of how many tubes they had in supply at any given time, so nobody can say for sure how many of them were even taken. They just know that they were being used pretty fast and nothing else. They don't know how many were used. They don't know how many patients could have been injected with it. They have no idea what number of epinephrine tubes they actually had, so there's no way to say how many 
could have been missing. The defense brought up multiple witnesses who were patients who had been cared for by Kristen, who loved her as a nurse. There were patients who were there with severe issues who said that they owed their lives to Kristen because of the care that she provided. They also brought forward their own doctor who said that he actually did not believe that the sudden cardiac arrests of any of these patients could have been caused by epinephrine. He said that epinephrine is a fast-acting drug, so it would be in and out of his system within five minutes. In the case of Stanley Jagodowski, the way the other nurses described it was that she went into his room, he yelled, ouch, and then 15 minutes after that, that is when he had the cardiac arrest. The doctor claimed that this time frame is simply too long for the epinephrine to be the cause. He believed that every patient was already on their way to death because of the conditions that they entered the hospital with, and not everybody needs a full explanation or other symptoms for somebody to have a sudden cardiac arrest, which is true for some patients. Sometimes there is cardiac episodes that happen pretty much out of nowhere, but most of the time, in my opinion, there are signs and symptoms that go leading up to it or something that causes it, like physical exertion or something like that. These patients were on a ton of different medications, though, and they had chronic illnesses, so the defense said that it made sense that they could have died suddenly without any other factors involved. Again, all of the other medications and other things contributing to their health problems that could have been what actually caused them to die. Then when it came to her confessions, they said that she was under an immense amount of stress during the investigation, not because she did it, but because she was being accused of crimes that were so heinous that she knew she was not guilty of, so this caused a great amount of stress for her. So after hearing evidence from both sides, the defense and the prosecution both made their closing arguments. Again, the prosecution summarized that there is no way that all of these patients died under Kristen's watch of natural causes. The evidence is there. There are witnesses. And most of all, she admitted it to two different people. Then the defense basically said that Kristen is just the unluckiest nurse of all time. She isn't the one who stole the epinephrine those drug addict nurses did it. These closing arguments lasted for two days until February 23rd of 2001 before the jury of nine women and three men were sent off for their deliberations. And they deliberated for two entire weeks, which is just insane. Now it does kind of make sense in this case since there is so much here and there is so much to go over, but two weeks, that is very surprising to me that they were allowed to go that long without coming to a decision. But either way, after those two weeks, the jury came back and decided that for the deaths of Ed Skirwa, Kenny Cutting, and Henry Hewden, she was guilty of first-degree murder. On Stanley Jagodowski's death, she was found guilty of second-degree murder, and then she was found guilty of attempted murder for two other patients. After hearing the verdict, it was time for her sentencing. At her sentencing hearing, the prosecution argued that the deaths were, quote, morally repugnant and deserve death. They were so dark, so unfathomable, that the circumstances of these murders show that no humanity exists behind a mask. Behind that face, it is dark. It is empty. It is evil. The defense asked the jury to show mercy. They said that it was never her intention to kill anybody. All she wanted to do, innocently, was to cause medical emergencies so that she could be a hero. That's all she tried to do. It wasn't that big of a deal. So, have mercy on her. The jury actually could not come to a decision regarding the death penalty, so that was left up to the judge. And in the end, the judge sentenced Kristen Gilbert to four consecutive life sentences. She was transferred to the Women's Federal Prison in Carswell, Texas, where I believe she still remains. She submitted multiple appeals, and I did read them, but as far as I have seen, all of them have been rejected. So, that is where the case sits now. I think this case is pretty clear. I do think she killed all of those men for attention. I think that it started right when she became a nurse, seeing as how the death rates were pretty off when she first started, and I think it was for attention, but I think it accelerated greatly after starting her relationship with James because that gave her more and more and more attention. I do think that she used her knowledge and skill to inject those patients with various drugs to make them code, I think that she had all of her coworkers fooled for so long, and that is how all of this went unnoticed and unchecked for so long. Again, 
So many nurses said that they didn't want to ruffle any feathers. They didn't want to ruin Kristen's career if the accusations were unfounded because she was so well-liked and so well-respected by her colleagues. But when things got worse and worse and worse, like I said, those nurses couldn't ignore it any longer. I think that she had both Glenn and James fooled, and even when she was acting out and being crazy, they still couldn't see it, which I think is pretty bonkers to me. At the end of the day, they did get justice for a few of her victims, but as I stated before, she could have killed as many as 300 patients or at least taken part in the deaths of those patients. I hope that the hospital did a very comprehensive review of each and every patient who died under her watch, and if there is anything suspected, I at least hope that they looked into it and let the families know. I know that it's not realistic to ask for a trial and conviction for that many patients, and she is already hopefully spending the rest of her life in jail, but those other victims do still deserve justice and their families deserve answers. So if nothing else, I hope those other cases are treated with the same respect and care as the ones that I discussed in these videos. But that is all I have for this case. This was definitely a long one, but it was a very interesting one. I want to hear your guys' thoughts on this case, and I want to know what you all think about these two-part series as well. Do you like these kinds of videos? Do you want to see more serial killer videos in the future? If so, let me know which ones. Do you like these two-parters? Do you like these more deep dives where I go very in-depth in these cases, so much so that it might take two hours to cover them? Or do you prefer more condensed videos that are about, you know, a half hour to an hour? Let me know that down below as well. But with that, that is where I'm going to close out today's case, and I am so looking forward to hearing all of your thoughts on this one. But either way, if you did like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn that notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!